Welcome to the Practical Parenting Series. My name is Pam Belisle. I'm the Executive Director of the Parent Resource Center. We hope that you enjoy taking part in the parenting journey with us. In the next few sessions, you'll learn more about parenting styles, how our parenting style was developed, are we the parent that we want to be, or are we still working on becoming the parent that we choose to be for our children. We'll talk about self-esteem, communication, stress management, discipline, and safety. I hope that you enjoy watching the video and putting new tools in your parenting toolbox. How we handle stress is up to us. What I'm going to say to you is there are books and magazines and DVDs and information galore about ways to cope with stress and how to handle stress. What I want you to know is it's up to us. We know what's going to work for us. For me, it's laughter. It's change of scenery and laughter. I will, if I'm feeling overwhelmed, and whether that be stress in the negative place of stress, just feeling overwhelmed and yucky, I'll watch a funny movie. Adam Sandler's one of my favorites. You know, I'll just find something with Adam Sandler and know I'm going to laugh. Um, other people, it's working out someplace physical. Some people like to go to the gym. Other people like a, like a weight bag. Some people will rip magazines. Some people, the, the joy of that paper in their hands and just ripping something can be um, a positive for them. I've had other people say that they like to throw things and as long as it's within safe boundaries and you know you need to clean it up, go ahead, do what you need to do. Um, and whether that's shaving cream, you know, handfuls of shaving cream in the tub, or it's, you know, rocks outside, it doesn't matter. It's whatever's going to redirect our minds and our, and our feelings onto something more positive. When we talk about discipline in a little while, we'll talk about time out. And that's exactly what time out is supposed to be, is an opportunity for children to de-stress and utilize those feelings that they're having in a different way. So even though we're big, we need to be able to, we can't just go to time out. You know, we just can't take off for, you know, I'm 39, so if somebody said to me, I had 39 minutes to just sit in peace and nobody could bother me, I'd be saying, hell yeah. You know, a little person saying a minute per, per year of their life and they're going, this is a long time, you know. Mm -hmm. But sometimes that solitude isn't what we need as, as adults either. Um, a funny movie, physical approaches. Um, listen to your body understanding that your body's telling you when you have had enough when your body's had enough and you may start to um, have headaches back pain sometimes massages or rub downs and hot baths are great stress reducers depends on what we enjoy learn relaxation techniques get adequate sleep statistically it will say six to eight hours per night is one of hum an adult human being needs for adequate sleep. I don't know a lot of folks that are parents that get six to eight hours. That's a long time. Mm -hmm. I might get an eight hour sleep about once a month and my kids 12. You know, I mean, so never mind if we have little people, you know, um, you know, that's, that really is a lot of time. But if we try and we try to make that a priority, adopt a new attitude. Sometimes we do bring our stress upon ourselves because we worry about the little stuff or the big stuff that we have absolutely no control over. Sometimes there's stuff that just is gonna happen. And I'm not saying you know, have a screw it attitude. I'm saying process it and say, I don't own this. Own what is yours and let other people own what is theirs. Keep the drama to a minimum. If it's not your drama, let it go right outside where it belongs. If it is your drama, then get rid of it. If you brought it in, you can bring it out. Set realistic expectations. How many of us, honestly, set realistic expectations for ourselves? Most of us don't. Most of us, you know, push beyond our means. And I'm not saying don't reach for the stars. That's not at all what I'm saying. What I'm saying is in everyday life, we put so much on our plate that realistically we still have a full plate by the time it's nine o'clock ten o'clock I have to I have to I have to you know 
we really need to set those realistic expectations and understand that we are nonetheless human. Get organized. That is a great way to avoid some of the stress. Some people just feel overwhelmed just by being in their own home. Um, if you have too much stuff, different places, or it's you're not feeling comfortable, um, leave work at work. That's always a good one. Develop a support network, a, develop a social life, volunteer your time. If you, I'm, and I'm not saying go out and party. I'm saying develop within yourself what it is that you enjoy. If you enjoy going for a walk in nature, then go for a walk. If you enjoy just sh window shopping, go, you know, go to the mall, go wherever and go window shopping. If you do not like people around you, surround, if, the, if too many people surrounding you bothers you, then the mall, that window shopping is not the place you need to be, okay? But you know what works for you. You know what's going to make you smile, what's going to release some of your energies. If you do not have your own transportation, save up the money, take the shuttle bus or the Zoom. Um, you know, transportation can be a huge barrier, but save up that buck or $2 to be able to take the bus and just be able to get out of the same scenery. When I was growing up, we didn't have a whole lot of money. We had a lot of love, but we didn't have a whole lot of money. And it, that was a treat. Mom and I would ride the shuttle bus on school vacation. We'd get on and we wouldn't get off. We'd spend half the day just riding around. We'd go the whole route and just keep on riding because we were people watchers. We liked to, you know, watch other people and what, you know, the hustle and bustle of what people were doing. But that worked for us. <coughs> Whereas other people would be like, no, you couldn't make me go on that bus. <laughs> and so recognize your feelings. Recognize what it is that are your triggers. What's going to push you over the edge in your stress level or in your level of frustration can be communicated out. It can be helped, but you have to know what it is before you can get out for it. And that's not saying if you're a giving person, I'm not saying I want you to become cold and not give. I want you to find a happy medium for you. I want to find what works for you and your family. This is an interesting uh, little tidbit that I found online. A lecturer, when explaining stress management to an audience, raised a glass of water and asked, how heavy is this glass of water? The answers called out ranged from 20 grams to 500 grams. The lecturer replied, the absolute weight doesn't matter. It depends on how long you try to hold it. If I hold it for a minute, that's not a problem. If I hold it for an hour, I'll have an ache in my right arm. If I hold it for a day, you'll have to call an ambulance. In each case, it's the same weight, but the longer I hold it, the heavier it becomes. He continued, and that's the way it is with stress management. If we carry our burdens all the time, sooner or later, as the burden becomes increasingly heavy, we won't be able to carry on. And I really like that one because it's true. You know, if we have one large stressor in our life, and that's, you know, ah, it'll end. It, it'll be fine. It'll go. But then here comes another one creeping in. And here comes another one. And by the time there's five or six, you might have been able to hear, carry the burden of that one issue. But now you've got five, six, ten. You know what? It's going to get to be a strain, and it's going to make take its toll upon you. And when it's taking a toll upon you, it will also take a toll upon your family. Because remember, those that love you are also going to feel the impact of your stress. If you're feeling out of sorts or you're not taking the best care of yourself, your family will know it. They may not say anything about it, but they certainly will know it. So here are some ways of dealing with the burdens of life. Accept that some days you're the pigeon and some days you're the statue. Always keep your words soft and sweet just in case you have to eat them. Always wear stuff that will make you look good if you die in the middle of it. <laughs> Drive carefully. It's not only cars that can re be recalled by their maker. If you can't be kind, at least have the decency to be vague. If you lend someone 20 bucks and never see that person again, it's probably worth it. It may be that your sole purpose in life is simply to be kind to others. Never put both feet in your mouth at the same time because then you won't have a leg to stand on. Mm -hmm. Nobody cares if you can't dance well, just get up and dance. Since it's the early worm that gets eaten by the bird, sleep late. Mm -hmm. Remember the second mouse gets the cheese. When everything's coming your way, you're in the wrong lane. Birthdays are good for you. The more you have, the longer you live. 
You may be only one person in the world, but you may also be the world to one person. Some mistakes are too much to only make once, too much fun to only make once. We can learn a lot from crayons. Some are sharp, some are pretty, and some are dull. Some have weird names and all are different colors, but they all have to live in the same box. A truly happy person is one who can enjoy the scenery on a detour. These, you know, these are funnies, but they simple, they're simple ones that really can make you think. I love the crayon box because it's true. And we live in a world where, you know, where none of us are the same. None of us are, are vaguely the same. We, but we all <coughs> live here together and we all undergo the same stressors and the same choices in life. Um, whether, you know, whether we have lots of money, we have no money. Um, where, where brown, pink, purple, or yellow, it doesn't matter. We all endure those same, uh, same stressors and the same happiness as well. We want to make sure that our children are learning stress management tools as well. Has anyone ever thought about that? How we are showing that we're stressed, how we cope? That's how our kids are learning to cope with stressful situations. Uh, one of those kind of behaviors that stands out to me is if you come home, and I don't know if you, anybody does, that's, you know, that's listening to this conversation, but if you come home and the first thing you do is grab a bottle of beer out of the fridge or pour a glass of wine and say, oh, it's been such a stressful day, remember that, that that's what your kiddos are saying. So, you know, when they're 14, 15, and they, you know, you catch them that they, you know, they smell like they've smoked dope or somebody tells you that they've smoked, well, maybe your glass of wine may have had a, you know, when you were stressed, may have had an influence on them deciding to smoke a joint to relax. And there it goes deeper and deeper and further and further. Um, if you to find a way to relax and, and, and you know to release your stress, you go throw um, you know go weed your garden and throw stuff. That doesn't mean that your child's going to be a florist. I'm just making a point that you know they're, we're modeling this stuff for them. And if you're stuffing down those feelings, even though you everybody around you knows there's something going on and you're stuffing down your feelings either literally or with food, trying to just stuff them down because you don't want to deal, that's something else that your children are modeling, and, and, um, or if you're avoiding food. So I'm not going on a soap box. I just want you to be mindful of those, those trigger pieces because we're not doing ourselves or our kiddos any favors. If you've got something going on, find someone that you can trust to talk out those, those times of frustration. Um, if you don't have in somebody safe as a loved one in your family or that's close to you in your family or your extended family or your friends, then there are wonderful counselors who can be that support team. Most counseling centers do offer a sliding fee scale, so don't tell me I don't have the money because I won't accept that one as, as a reason. I'll accept it as an excuse, but I surely will not accept it as a reason. Okay. There is, and if, if at first you go to counseling and you're not comfortable with the person that you're with, it's okay to switch. Sometimes you're not the right personality, personality match. And if you are going to take that time and take that initiative to work on the stuff that is stressing you out or maybe some traumas from the, from the past, you've got to have the right connection with your, with your clinician. If not, you might as well talk to the white wall behind me because it's, you're not going to get out of it what you need. Um, and that's okay. It's not hurting anybody's feelings. It is what it is. Um, you need to make sure you have the right fit. I could go on that soapbox for a long time. <laughs> I will not because I respect you more than that. Um, but, but as you saw by watching the Don't Shake video, Don't Shake Jake video, I do know a little bit about stress and about trauma. So, you know, I don't think I'm, you know, speaking out of my bottom by any means. I do know <coughs> what those dirty, rotten offals feel like. And they can eat you up. So I want you to think about healthy self-care. Um, instead of negative self-care, I want you to be mindful about taking the time for self-care and modeling that for your children. Are you modeling positives? And I'm not saying everybody's life's gonna be perfect and you know, everybody's happy and you know, somebody's going to yoga on Monday and they're doing the gym on Tuesday and oh, I think I'll get my fingernails done on Thursday. 
you know what, living in a real house, I know we don't have the opportunity to have, you know, a couple <laughs> hours for ourselves every single day. Are you kidding? That would be fantastic. Welcome to the real world. <laughs> but what you can do is make yourself a cup of tea. Light a candle. Uh, a fresh, nice smelling candle. Read a book. I'm not saying you're going to get a, I'm not, I'm realistic. I'm not going to say you're going to get a chance to read a 400 page book in one setting. I'm going to say if you get a couple pages at a time, it still feels good. Um, take a bath. Um, lavender is one of my favorite scents for relaxation. Um, chocolate is also known to be a stress reducer. That doesn't mean you get the big bag of Hershey's Kisses and you eat them all. And <laughs> you can if you want to, but then you're going to have a bellyache on top of feeling <laughs> stressed. <laughs> you might be de-stressed, but you're going to get a bellyache. Um, you know, so just be mindful of anything in moderation. Um, there are so many different ways that we can um, de-stress, but it's all in what's going to work for us as individuals. You can go online. I mean, there are thousands of websites. Mints are a way to reduce stress. Mint can help with lowering feelings of anger and nervousness. Um, so add a, a mint or fresh herbs to dinner. Um, have some milk. This is an interesting one. The age-old remedy of having a warm glass of milk to relax may actually work. Milk contains tryptophan, which can help settle you down and make you sleepy. It's, it's the same stuff as a turkey, as um, the tryptophan is the same stuff that's in a turkey. Hmm. Learn to let go of control. Uh, think that we all get stuck in that one at, at one time or another. Does anybody journal? Mm -hmm. Write your thoughts on paper. <laughs> Um, is a great reducer. If you are concerned that somebody else will, will read your thoughts, rip it up after. Just write it out, rip it up. If you're concerned that somebody may take your thoughts out of context and it may have a negative effect on you, make sure that you get rid of it. If you do, are a person that enjoys your body being touched or doesn't mind your your immediate space being invaded you can get a massage that sounds strange because most people will say you know massage is the best thing the best thing if you have stuff that has happened you have concerns with your own personal body and the safety thereof massage is not the tool that you need sometimes that will send triggers if there's stuff that's happened in the past and your body has been violated then massage is not a healthy tool for you. But there are many other ones that um, can be a positive attribute. In order to do my job fully, I need to clarify that the Parent Resource Center in no way is saying these are the things that you need to do to handle your stress. What we're saying is these are tools that may be able to help you along life's journey. If you are feeling overwhelmed that life is just getting too much to handle, please, please reach out to your doctor or your clinician or even the crisis response line to be able to get help with this level of stress that you're enduring. Let's have some more laughs. I always like to put laughs in after my, I feel like that public service announcement. Please do not hold us responsible for your stress level. <laughs> These things may not work for you. So, again, I'm going to, I'm going to read because they're just too, too good not to. <laughs> At lunchtime, sit in your parked car with sunglasses on and point a hairdryer at passing cars and see if they slow down. <laughs> Page yourself over the intercom and don't disguise your voice. Every time someone asks you to do something, ask them if they want fries with that. Put your garbage can on your desk and label it in. In the memo field of all your checks, write for smuggling diamonds. <laughs> you know how some people are just so stiff. You cashiers and stuff. They're so <laughs> stiff. I always want to do that one just to be able to see if anybody really cares. Right. You know? Anybody <laughs> really, really? But as often as possible, skip rather than walk. Even if you don't find that entertaining, I can assure you that there will be somebody else that you will have just lowered their <laughs> stress level because if they see a grown person skipping down the road, they can't help but get a laugh out of that. When the money comes out of the ATM, scream, I won, I won! <laughs> Sing along at the opera. Now, that might irritate other people, but oh well. Specify at the drive through that your order is to eat in. <laughs> order a diet water when you go out to eat. Keep a straight face. 
five days in advance, tell your friends you cannot attend their party because you're not in the mood. <laughs> Have your co-workers address you by your wrestling name, Rock Bottom. When leaving the zoo, start running towards the parking lot, yelling, run for your life, they're loose. That'd be awesome. Oh, <laughs> especially, uh, yeah, like York's animal farm. York's animal farm. Gray's animal farm, you know. Tell your children over dinner that due to the economy, we will need to let one of you go. Don't use punctuation. And remember that laughing is good for you and your child. These are, these are some just really silly little things, but they really can make a huge difference. So if your doctor said to you, take two jokes and call me in the morning, would you laugh? I would hope so. Mental health professionals and researchers are showing that laughter truly is a source of stress reduction. Researchers have found that when people laugh, a part of their brain's reward system is triggered. In this reward system, a person feels pleasure and wants to have the same pleasant feelings over and over again. The areas of the brain triggered by humor are the same ones that are triggered by drugs like amphetamines and cocaine. I always think that's such an interesting mm. statistic, that the same you know, laughter, such a simple concept. It's a lot cheaper, too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and if you get addicted yeah. to laughter, I'm happy. So let's talk a little bit about stress and what, what things, what's one thing that stresses you that you want to put on your to change list? There's something that you can think of right away that you do or that is happening that causes you, that allows you to feel more stress. Money. Money. So I was going to say that. So what can we do about money? What are some ways that we can process money as a stressor? We can make more, we can spend less, or we cannot worry about it. Because if there's not enough of it to go around, there's not a whole lot you're gonna do about it right away. It's gonna be a process and one foot in front of the other to make that barrier go away. Or at least lessen that barrier. Anybody else? What else is a stressor? Transportation. Transportation. We can find other forms of transportation, not always the most reliable. Um, but if we don't have our own vehicle, then we can ask a friend. We can take the bus. Um, we can reach out to some of the transportation companies as long as we give them plenty, plenty, plenty of fair warning. Um, uh, they typically will be able to find a driver to be able to get you from place A to place B. If that is a medical or a mental health appointment, we do have um, drivers, volunteer driver services. We also have a program that's called Friends and Family um, that if, if, a, if you have main care for your insurance program and a friend is bringing you to medical appointments, they can be reimbursed for that mileage. Um, so that's something that you really want to look into. They have a free bus to cap. Yes, yeah. as long as you call in advance and make sure that mm. you're, uh, yeah. you're, they're aware of where you need to go. But even, you know, people will say to me, you know, oh, I'm just doing a favor for a friend. I get that, but that little bit of mileage reimbursement can add up very, very quickly. So think about those little things, and people will say, you know, no, I didn't go to the food pantry. I don't have enough food to eat well, but I've got enough. I've got more than somebody else does. And I respect that on one hand, but there are services out there, and some of my dearest friends are, are some of the folks that run these programs, and they are there because they want to help people. So if that means that you go to the non-food pantry, uh, because we cover both the Bitterford and Sanford areas and, and outside areas. I don't want to name anybody by name, but say you go to one of the non-food pantries and you are able to, in a month, get 12 or $15 worth of household supplies to be able to help your family, whether that be toilet paper, trash bags, what, uh, toothpaste, toothbrush, whatever that may be. You could take that $15 and put it into another gallon of milk and a loaf of bread I'm, I'm pushing it by getting a whole lot more than that 15 bucks in this economy but that's it's okay to do that it's there's the people that are running these programs do it because they want to be able to see that we're all safe 
loved and nurtured. Sometimes if you feel like, nope, I'm taken from somebody else, take the opportunity and ask them if you can volunteer. Would that be something that would, would allow you to be more understanding um, and not feel like you're taking from somebody else? If you gave your two hours of service, even at 10 bucks an hour, that's $20 worth of food or, or whatever kind of product that you just earned because you just shared your heart and hands. And you may be that one smile that somebody that came into that pantry or into that service provider, you might be the smile that made their day. So sometimes just be in there. So think of things outside of the box uh, when we look at what, what we need and how we can pay it forward to help others. Money and transportation are two, are, are two of the biggest stressors. Those are number one and number two. Number three usually comes in as a current partner, ex-partner, um, and relationship junk. That's, that's pretty much level three. And that goes back to communication, opening up those lines of communication. Um, if they're not willing to do so and they're not willing to change, remember you can't change somebody else. They make the choices. You make your own choices and they make theirs. Um, so trying to fix it um, and change who someone is without them wanting to make those changes, you're going to definitely add more stress to your plate because you're fighting a losing battle. But if you communicate and share how you feel and what you feel needs to change and they don't accept that, that's on them, not on you. So don't, again, don't hold somebody else's junk. It's really important not to. I want to go from stress to discipline. Why do I line the, seri the series up the way that I do? Because from stress, when we're talking about kiddos in our lives, comes discipline because if we are trying to parent under a high level of stress, sometimes we're not using the tools that we want to. It's we're short-tempered, we're short-fused. We may reach out in anger or frustration and do something that we'll regret. We may do some name calling. We may not set appropriate limits. I'm going to start with there. That setting appropriate limits for our child or children is very, very important. But we want to remember that we need to look at what kind of limits we set. It will depend on a lot of factors. We want to select limits carefully. Things you think are necessary and as much as possible, consider the child's point of view. The limits that you set with children should protect property, protect children from physical harm, protect others from emotional harm. So what does that look like? We want to set kinds of limits that protect children from physical harm. What does that mean? Um, what kind of limit would be a protection of physical harm? No violence. Well, like my son goes to his grandparents. Mm -hmm plays on his little power wheel, four wheeler, does all these little jumps and stuff. Nice. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> a little I was out there one day and I, <clears throat> I thought that, you know, they let him do other stuff. Well, I guess he knew that he wasn't supposed to do certain things. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. And I was letting him do it. Mm -hmm. And um, afterwards, he got told he couldn't play on four wheeler anymore. But I guess uh, stuff like that, it's stuff that, you know, reasonable limits. Mm -hmm that something I thought was reasonable was kind of probably letting him get away with a little too much. Yep, yep. <laughs> but. What else? You were saying something else that was one to protect from physical, physical harm. Not letting a kid across the street by themselves. Mm -hmm. Hold their hands. Teaching them to stop, look, and listen. Um, those are ways that we can avoid physical harm. Protect property, what does that mean? Protect what you got. Protect what you got. Because you're angry does not mean that you can break your video game. Because you're angry doesn't mean that you can throw the deck of cards on the floor. Um, teaching our children other ways to express their feelings without causing damage to property. Um, the kind of limit that we don't write on walls. You know, we, we don't write on walls because that's physical property. What about things that protect children from, from psychological harm or emotional harm? How can we, what does that look like? What do you think of when you think about setting limits around that? Yes. A parent who 
who's in a bad mood, mm -hmm. depending on what caused them to be stressed and if, and if they're taking it out on the wrong person. Absolutely. And when we, as the adults, take it out on the, on the mm -hmm. little person, we're teaching them that they can bully other people. We're teaching them that teasing's okay. If we call them names, it's okay for them to go to school or to childcare, whether if that's their form of school, and do that to others. We need to show limits that res have respect for others' feelings and their ideas. We need to teach them this. They, this isn't something that they know automatically. We need to set reasonable limits. We need to tune into what is reasonable for your child to succeed. What that may look like for your child may be totally different than what that looks like for my child. My child may accept and push limits a little further, and I may allow those limits to be pushed a little further than maybe at your house. Like when you were saying about the grandparents, you know, you let it go a little bit further, but there were consequences. And that's what we're going to talk about next is if we set these limits, we need to keep them simple and make sure that they're about safety. Mm -hmm. Safety of physical safety of the child, emotional safety of the child or anybody else around them, and property. Other than that, we don't need to be barking orders at all times telling them what they can do and can't do and can do and can't do. Be consistent. If you're going to set limits, then be consistent. You can't give them a rule or, a, or something, a guideline to go by one day and turn around the next day and not give them the same message. That's not fair. That's like saying your boss tells you what to do one day and, not, and gives you heck for doing it the next day. As unfair as that is as an adult, think about that when we're being inconsistent with our kiddos. We, we can't control what the other parent, if, you, if your child lives in more than one household, we cannot control what messages are being sent in the other household, but what we can do is be very consistent when your child is spending time with you. So examine your limits with your children and ask yourself, are they really important? Are they reasonable? Are they clear enough for the child to understand? Do you apply and enforce them consistently? Do you encourage your child to set their own limits? You know, depending on the age of your child, these are gonna be different. Um, it, the consequences of actions are going to be different. The amount of limits that you have are going to be different. But we want to keep it very simple. No hitting, feet on the floor, inside voices, and listen. I mean, that you can give those simple a task. For most topics and most things that come up in life, those are pretty much the simple rules to abide by. You can add in as you go. You know, but if you're, you know, if you want to add hands to yourself, if you've got a hitter or a kid that's a pincher, poker, biter, and a space invader, meaning that if they invade your space this way, not as in a Martian, um, but if you have a child that is, you know, continuously in your space and you're not a touchy feely person, that doesn't work, guys. That that adds a good level of stress. So, you know, this is mama's space, this is daddy's space, this is your space. But use your words. We don't choose your words nice and kindly. We don't have to yell. Remembering that we didn't invent yelling. Yelling wasn't something that we, we chose. It was something that we learned. We have the opportunity to step back and say no more. When we set limits with children, children learn that we care about them. That we care enough to take the time to listen to what it is that they're feeling and what it is that they want. This doesn't mean that you shouldn't let your child run, over, run ragged and, you know, run all over you because your parents may have been too harsh with you. There's a balance. And that's what we strive for every day is to find that balance between what is too little and what is too much. Are discipline and punishment the same thing? What are your opinions? Are, when we first started talking, we talked a little bit about discipline and punishment in the very beginning of this series. Are discipline and punishment the same thing? They're not. They may be in your home or in other homes that you experience, but they're not supposed to be. Discipline comes from the Latin word disciple to teach. Punishment 
is the consequence for a negative action. So if we are using positive discipline, then what we're doing is we are reacting to something in order for our child to learn from the behavior. If your child writes with pink crayon, I'll call it red crayon, red crayon on the wall, you may discipline them by having them use the magic eraser with you to wash it off. You could punish them by spanking their bum and sending them to the room. What is spanking their bum and sending them to their room for doing something that a little person just decided to do because they have no impulse control? What does that teach that child? Hitting's okay. Hitting's okay. Mama's pissed, daddy's pissed, whoever, and I want to get a whack. That's the first thing. What else? Do you think that message is clear? You know, mm -hmm. if, if I'm yelling at my child or spanking their bum or sending them to their room over coloring on the wall, there's no connection. Kids need to make a connection between what they did wrong and what the consequence is because if not, they don't know what they did. And I will assure you, they will repeat it. Sending mixed signals. You're sending mixed signals. You're sending mixed messages. Why would you have that crayons one? out for a child to reach if they were too young to know how to no, really. use them correctly in the right way? Well, sometimes, sometimes kiddos, maybe, maybe somebody else is watching your child for an hour or so while you have doctor's appointment. Um, sometimes, you know, you're, you know, t trying to take a five-minute bath, and they get on the chair, and they find the crayons, and you come out, and the whole damn wall's done. I, you know, I mean, I, I, I unfortunately have heard about those really crappy situations. It's never happened, but yeah, yeah. I've we, heard of them. We did an event one time uh, with our program was a community baby shower, and one of the parents that was there. We were, we had long tables, and everybody was in the classroom style with the tables, and we went to fold up the tables and get ready to close the event. And a kid had taken crayons off of the gift table, you know, crayons and coloring book, one of the gifts. Huh. And the whole underneath the table, a little person <laughs> didn't have any paper. Mom wasn't, mom or dad, whoever wasn't paying attention, I guess. They made a beautiful picture right across <laughs> the white wall behind <laughs> oh, the table. No. You know, my team and I laughed wow. because we're like, well, guess somebody should have given the kid a piece of paper. <laughs> yeah, you know? Really. Did, we, did we get mad at mom and dad for not paying no. attention? No, good for them. They were paying attention to my class. You know, they were doing what they needed to do. Yeah, maybe there was a balance. Maybe the kiddo should have had a piece of paper instead of, you know, <laughs> fire station, white wall. Yeah. And they repaint it? No, great thing about um, magic erasers. I'm, I'm not plugging different advertisers, but oh, wow. magic erasers are the best. Best Forget tool. Crayon off. Oh, what kind they of Mr. Clean? What is it? Mr. Clean magic erasers. Yeah. Yep. Yep. What is it? Like a It's a little cleaning sponge. sponge. It looks like oh, a white, okay. looks like a plain old white sponge, but yeah. it will get grease off pans. It will get marker off walls. It will get crayon off floors. Yeah, I'm not running an advertisement here, but I'm telling you, if you have little people, they're a little bit pricey. But if you have little people in your life, have at least one sitting yeah. in the house just in case you need it. I keep the crayons up high and bring them down when he wants to use them. I watch them and then I put them back. Absolutely, up. but some people don't. God forbid, if you choose to, you know, maybe they choose don't have to the do the time to sit or the ability. You know, yeah. sometimes we don't have, you know, some parents don't have the ability to do that. So what we want to do is we want to think about discipline and punishment being two different things, but we also want to think about catching our kids being good. We want to praise them for things that they do well and keep the negatives to a minimum. So. Do, you, do we reward our children for everything they do well? No. No, because that doesn't do them any good in the real world. They're going to have to earn things. Um, you know, in the grown-up world, they're going to have to learn thing, earn things. So what we can do is that we can reward them through praise. Praise is the single most powerful re reward a child can receive, or anyone can receive for that matter. Use praise for being just because. I love you. You're a great daughter. You're a great son. Praise for doing. What a great job washing the car. Good effort trying to button your shirt. Two to three times a day, <coughs> try to find an opportunity to praise your child. Don't forget to praise yourself, too. Even if it's something little, another day of sobriety, another day of not smoking, another day that you didn't yell, another day that you took time for you, whatever that may be, whatever your goals are, reaching one step closer to reaching your goals, don't forget to praise yourself because that can make a huge difference.
in your life and that of your child as well. Nurturing touch. There are three ty types of touch. There's hurting, scary, and nurturing. Some of you know all three types of touch, unfortunately. You've experienced all three. We want to make nurturing touch the one type of touch that our children know is the right touch. Gentle hugs, back rubs, soft strokes of a child's back with, a, with gentle rocking are all nice, positive types of nurturing touch. Sometimes just a tap on the shoulder. You know, good job, man. You know, pat on the hand. Nice job, baby girl. Those simple little things. Try to use their name as much as possible as well. It feels good to hear your name. That's one of the hardest parts of doing this, this video for our extended audience is that, that interconnection not being there, about not being able to say, I feel like romper room. Some of, I don't know if anybody's in the room old I've enough to know what I'm talking about. No, I heard um, of it. There was, a, there was a magic mirror on this show called romper room. Hi, Susie. I see you out there. Hi, Robin. And she would say hello from TV. She'd say hello to whoever was there. And I'm telling you, if your name was the name of the day, you were like, she really saw me today. She saw me. This was a big, big deal. Use your child's name. Use their name, not just when you're getting stressed with them. Use their name just for positive things, just for being. Say, good morning, Joe. Good night, Irene. Whatever that may be, yeah, that was a you know running joke. And get a catch them quick. They don't come very often. Much, but I catch them quick. Um, so we look at those things as pretty simple, but they are some of the most important things we do for our children. Keep our junk to a minimum, and that means the yelling, the hitting, the swearing, um, reaching out in anger, and take your time to take a time out. So when we look at punishment that's a penalty for purposely doing something inappropriate the purpose of punishment is to decrease the likelihood that this is going to happen again there are different ways that we can use for punishment punishment has a time and a place a time and place for that include depending on how old your child is a loss of a privilege being grounded I will be the first to admit I am not falling to grounding my personal opinion is if you ground a child, you get grounded too. Hmm. If that's something you can't stick with, then take it out of the toolbox. Loss of privilege may look like less time watching TV. It could be you're going to bed 15 minutes earlier. Could mean that you're gonna lose your game for a week. Whatever's your child's currency, whatever's gonna be most important to them, and it's only for big stuff. This isn't for a minor infraction that, you know, Joey didn't listen the first time. This is stuff that, you know, Joey punched his brother. You know, these are big, these are big things. But save it for the big stuff. Um, you know, little Susie lied to you. Looked you right in the face and lied to you. Am I going to let that one go by saying, you know, honey, you know the rules of the house. No, I'm not. You bet your tail. But I'm not going to use a loud voice and I'm not going to use my hands. Those are the two things that I will pride myself on. I will not do. Will I use a loss of a privilege so they get that mom means it? You betcha. Am I going to take something away? Am I going to share with them how disappointed I am? You betcha. That's a form of punishment by that parental disappointment. Um, maybe paying restitution. If a child steals, make the, the punishment fit the crime as much as we can. Say the child steals uh, Legos from, from his buddy. Make him pay it back in Legos and bring those Legos back to his friend with some of his own. You know, say he stole a handful of Joe's Legos, send him, go with him to Joe's with a handful of your child's Legos, and the restitution is Joe gets two handfuls of Legos and a sincere apology from your child. You didn't own this. You didn't do this. I'm not going to say go to Walmart and buy this kid new Legos. Absolutely not. Your kiddo needs to own this, because if you don't nip it then, it's going to increase. You see what I'm saying? So, you know, say your child doesn't have Legos, that's why they wanted, to, you know, somebody else's Legos, find something else that's a currency, whether that be a box of crayons or, or whatever, and let them pay restitution um, to their friend. Most importantly, saying they're sorry and bringing them back to wherever it was to pay for that, disappoint, that disappointing behavior that they chose to have. Toy timeout. 
is a fantastic tool for children between five and usually nine or ten. Depends on the <coughs> development of your child. Um, oh, not for little ones. You don't use timeout. I use timeout. Mm -hmm. They go to timeout. Toy timeout. I use for that. In, we're gonna talk more about about regular timeout. Mm -hmm. Toy timeout is when they're not sharing a toy, when they're not using a toy appropriately. The child doesn't have to have timeout. What I prefer is we send the toy to timeout and it goes on the top of the fridge with this distinct answer that when you can treat this toy with respect or you can share, whichever may be the case, it can come back down. It doesn't come back down until at least the next day, depending on the, the severity of what they did with it. It could be a couple days before it comes back down. Um, regular timeout, children timeout, is when a child is given a rest period. One minute for every year of their life is what should be expected for a child to take a timeout. Different rules with timeout. Some people use it correctly. The way that we have been taught through literature, through many different researchers, to use timeout properly is you give three warnings only by counting. This is the magic in it. You're not yelling, you're not cursing, you're not saying, get over here, will you cut it out? I'm gonna send you to timeout. You don't even hear any of that. The child misbehaves and you say, that's one. Child then back talks you because they don't want to get one. And you say, that's two. The child slams the door and looks at you and says, I hate you. That's the way you take their little body, mind you, you're saying nothing. You gently place their little being into a chair or an area to think about their behavior. That sounds really poised and really accuracy. I did it on purpose that way. I want you to hear how simple this can be. That kid will get used to, you mean business, and you're not gonna blah, 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 blah. You did that, that. you're not gonna run your mouth. The tapes are gone, they've been rewound, we're not gonna yell. We're going to say, you have three choice, three chances to listen to what the simple thing is that I need. You choose not to listen, then you're gonna have a rest. Timeout does not start until they are quiet. Explaining these things to your children, any child over the age of two, uh, can be utilized, timeout can be utilized. If you're gonna have to bend a little bit, but the only thing that you do not bend on is you do not need to yell. You may have to be quiet and put that child right back into that timeout space three or four times. That first couple of times you do it. Some kids are so defiant that it's gonna be six months of just picking him up, putting him back, picking her up, putting her back. They will get the concept that the, you're doing this for their own good. It's not that I hate you, you're a little jerk. It is that that behavior was not okay. I'm a firm believer in timers. Set a timer. If you have a timer on your microwave, if you have a microwave, put a cup of water in the microwave, use that as your timer. When that, whatever, a kitchen timer, the microwave timer, the uh, oven timer, whatever you use for a timer, when it dings, that child knows that they can now get up. The time's up, okay? I'm not gonna talk to little Joey about why he spit on his sister and why he called his friend a name, he's going to get up out of timeout because the timer went off and go about his business. I'm not gonna bring up that junk to start another conversation about, because you, you say why, they know why. They know why they're going to timeout. If it's not something that is a harsh thing, if it's not physical injury, breaking a property, those same rules, if it's not gonna cause emotional, physical, harm to themselves or to somebody else, or it's not physical property that's being damaged, use redirection. One of the best tools is redirection, especially with little ones. You know, if they're getting into, um, you know, they keep getting into the same puzzle, the same crayons, the same things over and over and over again. First of all, maybe you want to be putting them up higher so they're not getting into them. Or if they just like clear off the little video cabinet or the DVD cabinet, you got to own this, man. Move them. If you don't want to be picking them up, playing pickup, move them. Um, you don't want to use it too much, though, right? Because doesn't that defeat the purpose? Then they just don't care. Well, it depends on how aggravated you are. The time. If you're gonna, right? No, we don't. We want to use redirection. 
So if, you know, say little, little Joey is continuously going after the video captain and he's taking all the videos out and this annoys the life out of you. I'm not going to give this kid time out for it until after it's happened a few times and redirection has not worked. Right. You see what I'm saying? If, if I cannot pick them up and put them in a different place. I'm not saying that your child, your home until your child is 10 should have nothing, you know, nothing glass from this height down. I'm not saying that. I'm saying, let's be realistic. If it's pretty colored, kids are going to go for it. That, especially little ones. So redirect them. Redirect them on to something that is safe. Um, but if they are causing emotional, physical harm to somebody else, or damaging property, that's when we use time out. Yeah, Other than that, we use time. redirection. Redirect them to another activity that is a more positive, positive activity. You can say, that's not okay, and then redirect them to something else. But you'll be talking to yourself continuously, or that kid will spend more time in time out than they will out in the real world mm -hmm. if you get them for every minor infraction. And you're not doing them any good. I want to share one of the most important pieces of literary history, I feel. It's called Children Learn What They Live, and it was written by Dorothy Law Nolt in 1972. That, and that was the same year that I was me. So it's always, you know, very cool with me um, to think that it's lasted and still in print, an important print, almost 40 years later. If children live with criticism, they learn to condemn. If children live with hostility, they learn to fight. If children live with ridicule, they learn to be shy. If children live with shame, they, fe they learn to feel guilt. If children live with encouragement, they learn confidence. If children live with tolerance, they learn to be patient. If children live with praise, they learn to appreciate. If children live with acceptance, they learn to love. If children live with approval, they learn to like themselves. If children live with honesty, they learn truthfulness. If children live with security, they learn to have faith in themselves and in others. If children live with friendliness, they learn the world is a nice place in which to live. And that's what we want most for our children, is to realize that the world is a happy place to live. And we have a hand in that. It's our choices by putting more tools in our parenting toolbox. We can make the difference in the life of a child. And sometimes it's your own child, and sometimes it may be somebody else's. But we are making a difference each and every day. And I thank you for taking the time with me and watching the Practical Parenting series. I hope that you've enjoyed the Practical Parenting series and added some new tools to your parenting toolbox along the way. If you have further questions or want more information about the Practical Parenting series or any of the programs that the Parent Resource Center offers, please visit www.parentresourcecenter.info. I hope you choose to have a great day and enjoy the journey.